It's a great pleasure uh, to welcome uh, Natalia Shepiga today. Um, so, uh, of course, welcome everybody for the European Tensor Network Colloquium. Um, just a small announcement for the people that are not subscribed yet to the email listing. There is somehow a link in the chat. Uh, and if you click on this and you can fill in your name, you will get the emails automatically. Anyway, so let's go back to uh, Natalia. Natalia Shepiga um, just became a professor in uh, Delft after doing first a PhD with Friedrich Mila and then working with two of the greats and Tensor Networks, uh, Stephen White and uh, Philippe Corbos. So um, today she will talk about chiral transitions and chains of Rydberg atoms. So please, uh, Natalia, the stage is yours. Thanks a lot, Frank, and uh, thanks to uh... Uh, to all organizers for keeping us uh, connected and uh, for giving me a chance to talk today. Uh, so before I start, uh, uh, come on. You don't see it, right? I don't understand. I don't know what happened. Uh, hey. Sorry. Okay, it will be like this. Uh, so let me announce uh, a PhD and postdoc positions available in my newly established group at TU Delft. So if you know any interested students on the market eager to do uh, a lot of coding, uh, I would be grateful if you transfer this information to them. Uh, okay, so today's story will be about chiral transition. Uh, this was a hotly debated topic in the uh, early 80s, remains an unsolved theoretical problem for 30 years, revived now in the context of Friedberg atoms, and finally we hope with Frederick that we have a solution, at least partial solution to this problem. Uh, here is the scope of my talk. I'll start with an extended introduction to what is a chiral transition, where the debates came from, and also introduce a model, the blockade model that we use to study these transitions. Uh, and then I discuss uh, a transition out of period three phase, which is uh, a bit uh, old, uh, issue already, we published it two years ago, uh, but uh, it's the first uh, numerical confirmation, solid numerical confirmation for a chiral transition uh, presented with DMRG. And it will serve as an introduction to the next topic, uh, the, our recent progress on chiral transition out of period four phase, where we detect Ashkin Teller uh, conformal point and also detect the new chiral transitions. Uh, in this uh, blockade models. And in the remaining time, I'm not sure if I'll be able to do it. I'll discuss the uh, relation and implication of these results to the rhythmic atoms. Okay, so let's go. The story begins with uh, asymmetric POTS model uh, studied in the context of adsorbed monolayers. Uh, it's a model where uh, different on-site states are not equivalent. Uh, and some states, uh, some pair of states are favored over another. And Hughes and Fisher analyze this uh, model and notice that despite the fact that ordered phase has three domains, for instance, here you have um, uh, like a black dot, big black dot, uh, followed by two small uh, dots, which is like uh, uh, forms a spirit three phase. Despite this, the fact that ground state is threefold degenerate, there are three types of domain, the transition is not three state pots. In fact, uh, the situation is a bit more complicated. And it's related to the fact that domain walls formed by this uh, uh, three state domains are not equivalent. Some of them are heavy and some of them are light, uh, called by Hughes Fisher original names. Uh, and this creates chiral perturbation. So the energy of domain sequence A, B, C is not equal to the energy of three domains A, C, B. And the phase diagram proposed by Hughes and Fisher consists of the following. There is a point, conformal point, in three-state pot universality class uh, where a chiral perturbation changes sign, or in other words, where chiral perturbation vanishes. Away from it, according to Hughes and Fisher, transition could be direct in a new universality class, and it's not conformal, until it reaches its point, where it splits into a costly Zaulis transition 
and commensurate and commensurate Pokrovsky Talakov tradition with incommensurate floors and face in between. That's a critical thing. Now, there is a counter argument came from Halden, Back and Bohr, who say that according to their field theory, this situation is impossible. Uh, the entire floating phase has to continue all the way till the pot's point. So there is no chiral transition according to them. Is it sound okay? You can hear me? Yes, very clearly. Yes. Yeah, yes. sorry, I just, yeah, I don't see your faces. So, yeah. Uh, so the answer to that comes again by Hughes and Fisher in their long paper in 1984. It's a wonderful paper. Every time I read it, I find something new. Who says that uh, the scenario by Howland, Bohr, and Buck is true, but only in the absence of dislocations. So what is shown here is uh, a phase diagram as a function of temperature, or uh, in the quantum language, it would be a function of uh, coupling, chiral, uh, chiral uh, perturbation delta, and dislocation of quantumness or fugacity. Z. Uh, so in, in the absence of dislocations, floating phase has to emerge immediately at a conformal through the pause point. But as soon as dislocations are allowed, according to Hughes and Fisher, there can be direct chiral transition for a while until it hits a Lipschitz point, this is QL line, beyond which it has to be a floating phase. And I think from theory side, it remains it. But 10 years later, they came first experimental evidence of the chiral transition uh, done on the Germanian silicium uh, surfaces, uh, where they measure a product, delta Q times psi. I'll come back to this quantity later. It show a clear difference between three state pause behavior, where it goes to zero, and a chiral transition, where it goes to a finite value. Now, why are we actually looking at it now in, in the context of quantum one chains is uh, is a peer, is Rydberg atoms. It's atoms uh, trapped in optical tweezers with a well controlled distance, and then uh, they are excited to a Rydberg state by uh, lasers with rapid frequency omega and uh, laser determinant delta, and when so. Uh, Rydberg atoms interact with Van der Waals potential V, which scales with the distance as uh, R minus 6. Uh, the phase diagram as a function of interatomic distance and the laser detuning most, mostly contains uh, lobes of uh, integer periodicity. And that's why it's most interesting to us uh, in the context of this uh, transition out of Z3 and Z4 phases. Now the Hamiltonian is given by this, um, uh, this expression that so contains a flip term, uh, the term that counts the number of bosons, or in other way, uh, chemical potential, and the interaction term. The way how, inter uh, how Van der Waals potential scales at short distances leads to a phenomenon known as Rydberg blockade, vanishing probability to find two atoms in Rydberg state within a certain distance um, and that gives us an idea how to approximate this model to uh, study phase transition at uh, as better possible accuracy as we could. So we define an effective model, which contains the first two terms absolutely identical to previous one, except now they act on a restricted Hilbert space that does not allow double occupancy, neither on single side, no, within a certain range, let's say nearest neighbor blockade, next nearest neighbor blockade, etc. Then we include as a correction next to blockade interaction. For instance, if we have nearest neighbor blockade, we keep next to next nearest neighbor repulsion and set all other tail to zero. So if you remember a talk by Garnet Chan four weeks ago, it's really bad idea if you want to explore uh, the entire phase diagram. However, it turns out to be a good uh, model to study the transition once we know the preliminary phase diagram. So what I show here in the background is a phase diagram obtained with IDMRG by Rada and Loichli. 
well, it's a sketch after them. And I show the region where our blockade model is applicable. So as you can see, a model with nearest neighbor blockade can be good to study top of the period two phase and the tip of the period three lobe. Model with next nearest neighbor blockade would be good to study tip of the period four uh, phase and, uh, for instance, uh, in region between period three and period four phases. So why would we actually care about this blockade model? Well, obviously, because it reduces Hilbert space and it reduces it drastically. So instead of Hilbert space 2 to the power of n, for nearest neighbor blockade, we have only Fibonacci number, which is 1.6 to the power of n. And for next nearest neighbor blockade, it's only 1.4. And moreover, we can even encode it in an effective way, so we reduce the complexity even further. So how to do it? In order to encode blockade into DMRG, let's look first at the fusion graph. And to me, it means uh, the rules, how we change the labels of left or right environments in the DMRG. So let's associate a label zero to the last empty site of, uh, of left environment and label one to the last occupied site. Uh, obviously, with nearest neighbor blockade, we have only three rules. We can either add uh, occupied particle to empty side or empty particle to either side. And we end up with this fusion graph. We don't have one-to-one -one fusion because then we have two occupied sites next to each other, which is forbidden for by blockade. Also know that this graph is symmetric in the sense that all arrows that they have point in both directions, which means that it's the same for left and right environment. But also it means that uh, there is a map into other models, for instance, quantum diamond model. But that's um, out of curiosity. Now, how to encode this fusion graph into, into DMRG? Uh, there were many attempts previously uh, based on uh, uh, purifying tensors and uh, other stuff. But basically what, what we have at hand is something like tensors uh, with three blocks. So we can have two empty sites together, we can have empty occupied, but what we cannot have only one block. And in order to do it efficiently, what we want to actually block diagonal structure, because then we can work uh, by blocks separately. It's reduced, we know, from U1 symmetry, it reduces computational cost uh, quite significantly. And in order to do so, I map my model onto an effective model where I uh, span local degrees of freedom over two side two bosons and associate my physical index with three, with a Hilbert space of uh, uh, consisting of three states. With this, two nearest tensors has always one boson in common. Look at this uh, green and uh, blue tensors. They have uh, this boson in common. And now I can use the occupation number of this boson as a unique quantum label that will give me one-to-one -one correspondence between left and right auxiliary bonds. So I uh, artificially create block diagonal structure. We use this, uh, uh, scroll. We use this uh, DMRG, powerful DMRG to work out the phase diagram uh, and sorry, it's mirror symmetry because here we use plus u instead of minus delta. But uh, with nearest neighbor blockade and next nearest neighbor repulsion, as expected, we see top of the period two lobe, the tip of the period three lobe, and the part of the disordered phase. As you can see, it is split into two parts, commensurate, where short range order is commensurate with Bay vector pi, and incommensurate, characterized by uh, some non-fixed Bay vector uh, in the short range order. This exactly model has been studied previously by Fenlis and Gupta and Sajdev, who find the direct relation of this model with the classical 2D model studied by Baxter, which is a hard hexagon bot model, for which it is known that there is an integrable line. And the transition along this integrable line is in periods three quartz model. Uh, away from this uh, point, however, 
it was not conclusive what's the nature of the phase transition. And that's the problem we're going to address uh, now with DMRG. According to Hughes and Fisher, there are three possibilities. Either the transition to period three is three state pods, or it's chiral, or it's through the floating phase. And the question is how to distinguish these three possibilities. Uh, answer is also given in the same paper by looking at the product of delta Q times psi. Remember, that's what was measured in silicium and the uh, uh, experiment. So when transition is three state pods, delta Q vanishes with a critical exponent that is twice as large as a critical exponent with which correlation lens diverges. When transition is chiral, in commensurate wave vector approaches its commensurate value with the same critical exponent as divergence of a correlation lens. And when there is intermediate floating phase, the system first hits the Costello-Zales transition, remaining uh, still at a finite wave vector Q. And by finite, I mean at a finite distance to commensurate value. So the product of the two diverges. In order to extract wave vector or Q and correlation lens, we look at the two-point boson-boson correlation function. And we fit it. So what I show here on the top uh, panel is the raw data. And first, we fit it only uh, to the exponential decay, discarding the uh, oscillations. And this gives us pretty good estimate of the correlation lens. Then we uh, remove the decay from, uh, from the data and fill the rest with a cosine. And that also gives us pretty good uh, uh, confident results for the wave vector Q, even close to commensurability. The fact that uh, all effect happens close, close to a critical point, a critical line, uh, also implies that we are always close to commensurability. And that's why we need so large uh, system size to be able to see the effects. But okay, we measure this quantity, and now we do it all the way uh, through three different cuts. One, far away from a post point, second, through the post point, and the third one, through another cut close to the post point, but away from it. And we see the following results. In the top panels, I uh, plot inverse of the correlation lens, in the second row, I plot wave vector Q and how it approaches its commensurate value to third. And in the lower panel, I show the product uh, of delta Q and psi. At the box point, you can see that correlation lens diverges in a symmetric way, with critical exponent similar on both sides of the transition. And moreover, this exponent is almost twice smaller than exponent with which uh, Q vector approaches its commensurate volume. Even qualitatively, you see that uh, despite that uh, we are very close to commensurability, <coughs> it approaches uh, with exponent larger than one. The product of the two, uh, delta Q and psi, clearly goes to zero. Now, far away from the uh, post point, uh, correlation lens diverges on two sides of the transition at a very different uh, manner. That implies there are not a unique transition, but there are two different transitions. We can even estimate the width of the critical phase, and in this case, it's about 10 minus 3. The Q vector approaches commensurate volume now at the exponent smaller than, uh, than 1. And actually, it's consistent, uh, both exponents is beta bar and mu bar, with the uh, cross talop of exponent 1 half. Delta Q times psi clearly diverges. Uh, before uh, at the cost hours transition. Now, as a third cut, which is expected to be a chiral transition, which is not too far from the bot point, we again see that uh, correlation lens diverges in a symmetric way on both sides of the transition. And this correlation uh, and this critical exponent agree with a critical exponent with which wave vector approaches its commensurate value. The product of the two goes to a finite volume, which is, uh, in our case, signals very clearly chiral transition. So to summarize this phase diagram, 
the nature of the uh, phase transition between period three phase and the disordered phase changes multiple times along the line. It is three state pots at the crossing of the critical line and integrable line. It is chiral on both sides of this three state pots point, but not too far from it. And then it is through a floating phase, intermediate phase of very small width, it's smaller than the red line. Uh, it, it's a two step uh, transition, first through a Costelizalis transition and then through a Kroski Talapov transition. So, as the next step, we will study uh, what happens, uh, which kind of transition is uh, out of period four phase. Uh, and as you can see here, to do so, we need uh, next nearest neighbor blockade. So we need to extend the DMRG algorithm. And for this, again, I construct a fusion graph. Again, I do it for left environment. So uh, I label uh, now environment by the last two sides. And I construct and I have four uh, fusion rules uh, that form the following fusion graph. By contrast to the previous one, it is now directed, which means that uh, for right environment, it looks slightly different. For instance, um, uh, for this particular model, we have to revert all errors. But it also means that probably there are no simple mapping to other constraint models of, uh, of this one. OK, to encode it into GMRG, uh, we basically do the same uh, what we've done uh, for a nearest neighbor blockade with span local degrees of freedom, not over two side, but now over three side. Thus, every um, auxiliary bond can be described by a pair of two shared bosons, which exactly forms three state uh, labels, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, uh, which creates a block diagonal structure. Now we have three blocks per auxiliary bond. The only subtle issue is that now, in order to keep uh, our MPS growing unrestrictedly, as we normally do in two-side DMRG, we need to do three-side DMRG. Otherwise, uh, one of the blocks are always bounded by the size of the block at the previous situation. So if we want to do two-side DMRG, we need to increase it artificially, as, for example, done in single-side DMRG. Okay. But what is known actually about um, possible nature of the phase transition out of period four phase? In fact, uh, we know that uh, the situation is going to be even richer because uh, uh, chiral transition is not always relevant. Chiral perturbation is not always relevant for this model. And if we come back to, uh, uh, to the Hughes and Fisher paper, what they say is that similar picture can actually be applied to period four phase, except uh, from the fact that uh, conformal line PQ, which was three state pots previously, uh, would have very uh, critical exponent along it that correspond to Ashkin Taylor conformal uh, theory. And there is no reason to expect that Lifshitz line would end up at Q point at zero uh, dislocations. It could end up somewhere at a finite value of dislocations. So let me rephrase it and let me probably replot it in a, in a simpler way. In the absence of chiral perturbation delta, the transition is expected to be conformal in Ashkin Teller universality class which is in fact the entire family of universality classes with continuously varying exponent that is controlled by so-called asymmetry parameter lambda. So here I show uh, Hamiltonian written in terms of Ising variables theta and tau, and the lambda uh, show the asymmetry uh, between hopping uh, flip uh, to, to different states. Uh, now, in the presence of chiral perturbation, if we are at lambda equals one that corresponds to pot's point, we know that chiral perturbation are irrelevant, so the transition has to remain in Ashkin Taylor universality class. If uh, we are at the four state uh, clock model, which is kind of two decouple Ising model, we know that 
uh, chiral perturbations are relevant, but leads directly to the emergence of the floating phase. Now, according to Hughes and Fisher, two scenarios are possible. Either there is a region where a chiral perturbation leads to a direct chiral transition before floating phase emerge, or there is no such region, no Lipschitz line, and then we end up with this simplified heptagon. Um, but where, in the first place, this asymmetry lambda comes from in the blockade model? We don't have uh, uh, the flip uh, always between ground state and the Rydberg state, where we can uh, find the asymmetry. It comes actually from difference in energy when we try to create the main walls in the system. So the ground state is one of the period four uh, states, which could be labeled by the position of the occupied site in the unit cell. For instance, here I use a ground state to be uh, domain A, where first site of each unit cell is occupied. If I now try to create a domain of, uh, uh, of type B within this uh, A ground state, uh, which is shifted by one site, it will cost me energy w, V3. The same is true for the domain shifted by three sites. However, the domain shifted by two sites costs different energy. It costs me one particle. Because of blockade, I cannot accommodate the same number of particles. And it's very unlikely that these two energies would be actually the same. So uh, there is some asymmetry. There is reason for some asymmetry. And in the following, we will try to estimate uh, how much asymmetry we actually have in our system. But before so, let's try to analyze uh, which asymmetry would lead to a chiral uh, perturbation to be relevant. And the answer comes in a Schultz paper that says that chiral perturbation is relevant as soon as crossover exponent is larger than one. And crossover exponent, according to Schultz, is given in terms of uh, Correlation length critical exponent, as shown here. It implies that as soon as correlation length exponent is larger than 0 0.68, uh, we are end up in this part of the phase diagram or in that one, where chiral perturbations are relevant. Now, luckily enough, there is an exact line that relates uh, critical exponent nu with uh, uh, asymmetry lambda. Uh, plugging in uh, the condition we found previously, uh, we end up that lambda should be smaller than 0 0.97, which is pretty close to one, which means that this transition occupies, th this part of the diagram occupy most of the interval. Okay, we perform DMRG simulation and we end up with this basis, a basic phase diagram. Again, no surprise that we see a tip of a period four phase, a top of period three phase and part of the disordered phase. We now want to study the transition to the period four phase. And we start with uh, identifying a conformal point in this transition. But unfortunately, unlike in the previous case, there are no integrable lines. And the question that we have, how to find this conformal point? What we propose is to look at the uh, equal Q lines, lines of uh, equal wave vector uh, that changes from 2 pi over 3 to 0 if delta goes to infinity, uh, to minus infinity. But it goes through a, a line with a commensurate value pi over 2, with exactly the same value of the wave vector that is stabilized inside period 4 phase. So it's natural to expect that uh, chiral perturbation vanishes where uh, in incommensurability also vanishes. And thus, it's, ex it's natural to expect conformal point to be at the intersection of this uh, commensurate line and the critical line. But let's check it. To check, we extract finite scaling of the amplitude of Friedel oscillations that at conformal point is expected uh, to scale is uh, with a uh, slope beta over nu, which is 1 8 for Ashkin Teller. We extracted all around the possible points 
and the final separatrix with a slope 0 0.124, which is an excellent agreement with 1 over 8. And it also allows us to determine the location of the uh, conformal point at a pretty good accuracy. At this point, we also compute a central charge. Therefore, Ashkin Taylor model is expected to be 1. And we find uh, the result, which is only 4% of uh, this value. And this is probably a finite result effect. OK, so there is uh, Ashkin Taylor point there. And the question uh, that we need to answer before we explore the rest of the critical line is which Ashkin Taylor, at which parameter uh, lambda the Ashkin Taylor point is there. And depending on this, we can realize different scenarios, right? Unfortunately, we cannot get this answer neither from uh, scaling dimension D nor from central charge because they are all the same for all values of lambda. But we can do have an idea from critical exponent nu. And if we compute critical exponent with which correlation lens diverges along this commensurate line and along continuation of this commensurate line, Natalia, there's a problem. We don't. I we don't hear you. We see a critical exponent zero point seven. Uh, is it just to not loud enough, or no? I think if, if you back you, up, you just if, uh, if stuck. Well, while, no, back up one okay. slide and repeat most of it. We yeah, we only hear the the last slide didn't work, but now it's fine again. Okay, uh, just let me know if again. So just back up one slide, maybe. This one? Yes. Yeah. Good. OK. Um, so I was telling that neither central charge nor uh, scaling dimension is good to distinguish uh, different regimes in Ashkin Taylor, but we can actually extract uh, correlation length critical exponent nu. And for this, we uh, compute the exponent with which correlation length diverges along the uh, commensurate line. And what we see is that nu is equal to 0 0.78, which is definitely above our critical value 68. So chiral perturbations are relevant. Now, to cross-check this uh, value, we want to extract lambda. And this we do by analyzing conformal tower of state. In other words, excitation spectrum. So what I show here in panel A is excitation spectrum of Ashkin Teller um, model uh, with 200 sites. And what I show here in B is the excitation spectrum of our blockade model. And we see that the structure of the spectrum is resemble when lambda is equal to approximately equal to 0 0.57. The exact numbers do not match because we have a non universal prefactor velocity. But the structure is actually the same. We can actually do it more rigorously by rescaling the lowest sector. So now this two is trivial. And we compare uh, the spectrum of our blockade models, red lines, with Ashkin Teller uh, results, it's black symbols. And we see that all crossing at all levels occurs for lambda equals 0 0.57. We also check this prediction against finite size effect here, and we see almost perfect uh, correspondence between a uh, conformal tower for blockade model and for Ashkin Teller model a uh, lambda 57. And we see that uh, for state pots point, it actually falls away. So it, it's clearly not a positive pot proposed previously in, in the literature. And if you now combine uh, two results uh, extracted new 0.78, and lambda 0 0.57 and compare this point uh, with exact line obtained by Komoto et al., uh, we see almost excellent agreement with exact correspondence. So we are quite sure now that our conformal point uh, can be characterized by these two values. Which means that chiral perturbations are relevant and uh, we are at the right Sound model. To be off. Sorry?
Can you hear me? Now, now I can. Yes. You're the same with everyone else? Um, okay. Uh, so I was telling that we have Ashton Teller point with this uh, characteristics. Okay. So now let's uh, let's explore the area around the Ashkin Teller point. And for this, I do the same as previously. I extract inverse of the correlation lens shown in top panel, wave vector Q shown here, and the product of delta Q times psi. At the Ashkin Teller point, that's left uh, left column. The uh, correlation lens diverges with the same critical exponent on the left and on the right. And the wave vector Q uh, approaches commensurate value with critical exponent larger than one. So the product of the two actually goes to zero in accordance with uh, all previous predictions. Away from it, but not too far, correlation lens still diverges in a symmetric manner with a critical exponent around 0 0.74. And it's the same exponent for correlation lens and for wave vector. And even uh, on a, on a cl um, qualitative level, you see that uh, the curvature changes. The product delta Q times psi goes to a finite value uh, and indicates, therefore, the presence of a chiral transition. Further away, we see that uh, the divergence of the correlation lens is very asymmetric, and therefore there must be two different transitions. Uh, critical exponent agree with one half uh, for pokrovsky talapov transition, and the same is true for critical exponent beta. The product delta Q times psi diverges at the Costello-Talas transition. So again, as in previous case, we see three different regimes, the conformal, uh, Ashkin Teller, uh, chiral transition, and floating phase. So, this phase diagram summarizes um, the nature of the critical line. Uh, we find that chiral transition uh, uh, stabilized not too far, up to uh, about V3 equal to uh, 2. Uh, and beyond it, there's a narrow floating phase. Again, it's narrower than the uh, width of the gray line. Below, the Ashkin Teller point floating phase actually merge together with the floating phase from period three transition, and this already has been observed by Rader and Loichli in the IDMRG study. Now, let me comment also on Kibble Zurich and dynamical exponents that we could extract uh, for these transitions. So, Kibble Zurich exponent depends on both. Uh, correlation lens exponent and dynamical exponent. At the Ashkin Teller point, uh, dynamical exponent is one because of conformal invariance of the point, but correlation lens exponent is 0 0.78. That's what we extract from DMRG. This leads to a uh, uh, Kibble Zurich exponent mu about 0 0.44. Away from this point, uh, Correlation lens uh, critical exponent that we extract is about 0 0.74. That's for one of the cut I presented. Uh, and we don't know, since it's not conformal transition, we don't know uh, the uh, dynamical critical exponent yet. But we know that, uh, that there is a hyperscaling relation that relates that uh, new and um, alpha critical exponent, specific heat critical exponent. Now we have to assume that alpha keeps value as it has at Ashkin Teller point. And that's not arbitrary assumption that was rigorously proved for a three state pods transition. And we're gonna check it now for four state pods. For this, we extract alpha numerically. And since it's specific hit critical exponent, we need to take derivative with respect to T. Well, we don't have T, so we take derivative with respect to uh, coupling. Uh, so second derivative of energy with respect to coupling gives us a slope which would correspond to critical exponent alpha. But we know that there are also uh, corrections to the critical exponent upon approaching a uh, critical point. 
So in fact, what we will take is this third derivative. Of course, numerically, it implies that we have really good convergence uh, necessary uh, for our energy. What I have here is uh, for 2,100 sites, I converge my relative energy uh, up to 10 minus 12 to be able to get rid of the noise. Uh, with this data, we can safely extract critical exponent alpha, which is at the pots, uh, sorry, at the Ashkin Teller point, uh, takes the following value shown in A. And then we also computed at other cuts away from this point uh, through chiral transition. And we see that it doesn't change much, which agree with us our assumption that it stays the same away from Ashkin Teller point. Also, out of curiosity, I showed here uh, the uh, divergence of um, the second derivative of the energy uh, only on one side of the transition, only on the disorder side, while second derivative remains finite in the period for phase. But okay, let's come back to, to this issue of uh, alpha critical exponent. So if we assume that it takes value of 0 0.44 as it was for Ashkin Teller, uh, point, uh, we obtain dynamical critical exponent 1.1, which is larger than 1, and which is, uh, uh, to the best of our knowledge, is the first uh, consistent explanation of uh, uh, dynamical critical exponent larger than 1 obtained in experiment. Uh, Kibble Zurich exponent is 0 0.41 which is smaller than at the Ashkin Teller point. And this is also good news because experimentally observed value 0 0.25 is pretty low. And uh, well, we're still a bit far, but we are moving in the right direction. So we believe that this uh, uh, chiral transition is uh, provides a consistent explanation to what has been observed in Rydberg Atoms experiment. Now let me analyze uh, how our findings actually related uh, to Rydberg atoms, how it would be adjusted. And for this, let me try to convince you that the same kind of asymmetry should be preserved also if we include a long range interaction. So here I argue that lambda is not equal to one, but away from it, because the energy of creating different domain walls costs different energy. Well, of course, differently. In a classical limit, uh, the energy to create uh, domain shifted by one side is 1.3, and energy created by a two side is 1.6, so it's about 0 0.3. If we include longer range interaction, but assuming more or less the same uh, critical line, same critical point, we get a value which is smaller, uh, but still finite. So there is still uh, some asymmetry present in a model. That means that we have two possibilities. Uh, in our blockade model, we are located somewhere here. If uh, the asymmetry is large enough, we are just shifted uh, towards lambda equal one, but remains in the area of chiral transition. So we have the same uh, phase diagram. Uh, qualitatively, we have a single Ashkin Teller point, an extended chiral transition beyond which we have a floating phase. If, however, asymmetry is much smaller and we approach lambda below 0 0.97, then we first have extended conformal interval of Ashkin Teller transition, then uh, chiral transition, and then the floating phase. But in any case, we should be able to observe, and we experimentalists should be able to observe uh, direct chiral transition in Rydberg atoms. And the fact that uh, in experiments they can do a system smaller than a few thousand sites that we can simulate actually implies that uh, they will be able to observe it over a larger distance because floating phase will be pushed further by finance effects. Um, with this, I would like to go to my summary and outlook. And um, I have two uh, sets of conclusions. First, uh, it's about chiral transition. So I presented you 
uh, if we confirm numerically Fusion Fisher predictions for chiral transition out of period three phase. Uh, we also detect a new universality class for chiral transition for period four phase, and soon it will appear in NC. Uh, it provides first self-consistent explanation for dynamical critical exponent larger than one uh, deduced from experiment, and it provides uh, a lot of new perspective from a point of view of of other models try to find uh, such transition in, uh, for instance, spin chains and ladders and other classical 2D models. Uh, so every time, you know, see a finite uh, single triplet gap across the transition, remember that it could be a huge uh, undiscovered physics below it. Uh, and second uh, set, of, uh, set of conclusions uh, is uh, regarding constraint tensor networks. So it seemed to be a new powerful tool to study quantum phase transitions. Uh, it can be generalized to other models. So the original uh, uh, DMRG algorithm was running for quantum dimer and quantum loop model. Uh, but it can also be generalized to other models with non-trivial fusion rules, such as uh, non-abelian anions. It also allows to, to do constrained fermions. And thus, after uh, Paul Fendley and Carlians Houghtons uh, use access to simulate uh, supersymmetric models. And uh, with Carlian, we already have a nice project on that. Uh, but also, this constraint tensor networks could be generalized to other dimensions in geometry. Uh, so obviously, ladders, it's uh, not much more difficult. Uh, and we already, with Philip, we already have first proof of principle uh, uh, IPEPS code for constraint to the square lattice and it can be generalized to other hexagonal triangle and whatever it is. With this, I would like to thank you for your attention and looking forward for your questions. Thank you, Natalia. This is a perfect timing. <laughs> so congratulations. So um, are there any questions? I have one. No, go ahead, go ahead. So Natalia, this is quite a tour de force, <laughs> so very impressive. Um, so, well, but it makes me wonder, you know, can the experiments um, compete with the sort of uh, detail that you can resolve for these systems? Uh, how does it how does it compare more with what what the experimentalists can do? Um, it's a good question. Um, it seems that uh, the number of Rydberg headons captured in experiment grows like by dozens every month. So probably soon they will be able to do thousands of sites, I don't know. Um, but um, yeah, I think uh, I think it's doable. I'm not sure if it's doable now, but uh, I hope they can do it. And uh, yeah, the point is uh, the finance effect here plays uh, on our side because uh, it pushes uh, floating phase further away. So it gives more chances to detect this direct transition in experiment. Mm -hmm. Thanks. I have a question, on, if I may. Sure. Well, actually, sorry, Luca, I think Paul was preparing a question. So Paul was- Okay, uh, okay, then I, I postponed it. Yeah, that's okay. Uh, no, no worry. Um, yeah, th thanks, Natalia, for that. Um, so, uh, question about why, do you understand why you see an only a particular single Ashkin Teller point? I mean, since there's a parameter and you, you have parameters in your lattice model, so it's not, it wouldn't have been surprising if you had seen a whole Ashkin Teller line in there. Do you have an understanding of why you don't? Uh, yes, well, it basically goes back to to this sketch, right? So if we would be too close to four state pots, uh, we would indeed see what you say, an entire Ashton Teller interval and then chiral transition. But it turns out that, uh, that we are far away. And so we really see a chiral transition just after we exit Ashton Teller point. Uh, in our preprint, we also show many uh, many cuts, so you can really see that uh, this conformal environment is destroyed slowly, but right away we leave Ashkin Teller point. 
Okay, but then there's presumably no reason why you need any Ashton Teller point, right? I mean, you, you're saying the, you know, the the lattice model is some line in this in this picture you drew, but it doesn't have to intersect the axis. At in all. fact, it's kind of right, but not for this model because let me show this plot here. So if we would have only this part of the diagram, then you're right. But as soon as we have commensurate line heating period for phase, at uh, this uh, line we know that there are no chiral perturbations. So it has to be conformal. Ah, good, good. So there has to be at least one point, and then it happens yes. to land in the phase where I see. What was the value again? I, you, you said it, but I already forgot of, of lambda that. that uh, 0 0.57, so kind of in the middle. Just some random uh, as far as you can. Yes, the point. So before it was speculated that it could be either four state clock or four state boats, and yeah, none yeah. of them would feed it to the to the experiment. And yeah, we have something but in between. I mean, if you add a longer range interaction, do this, can you change that value, or is that? I mean, uh, yes, sure. Uh, especially in delta. So delta is uh, extremely sensitive to uh, to longer range interaction, but it's kind of shifted all. Everything is shifted, right? So. Okay, good. So, right. So, all right. So, there's nothing really that special about that number. It just happened. To no, that's the thing. But what we estimate is by adding long range interaction, you uh, you increase lambda. So, you put it closer to uh, ah, four state it Always increases, as far as you say. Yeah. Ah, interesting. Okay. Good. Well, thanks. Thank you. Luca was there? Yes. Uh, 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 thank you, Natalia. It's a very nice talk. So I have uh, uh, a couple of questions. So the first one is related to the Z exponent that you find. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I have a, a question. So if I had uh, to uh, find it, I would have used the scaling, the finite size scaling of the gap. Uh, is there any reason why you can do that without any assumption with, with alpha, on, on alpha? Yeah, in a sense, you can find other way to extract that directly from DMRG, from MPS. Yeah, that would be alternative way to check our assumptions that alpha remains constant. Okay, and then I have another, uh, so it, it, when you find z equal 1.1, it means you, you are away from, uh, conformal field theories. And uh, in particular, we know that at Z equal to the uh, entanglement entropy doesn't diverge logarithmically anymore. What happened in between? Have you checked that? Uh, no, what we haven't. The entanglement entropy with respect to the size of the subsystem? No, but uh, in our case, it's difficult because uh, it's incommensurate close to an NZ transition. Uh, so what we see is basically waves, and it's too close to commensurate values, so it's uh, it's big waves. Uh -huh. So it seems kind of random. Okay. On a finite size system, of course, you can try to do infinite size DMRG, but uh, I'm not sure how well it would deal with uh, floating phase, with infinite uh, correlation and uh, in incommensurate interactions. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. So Natalia, maybe I have another question. So uh, the experiments, of course, when they, when they do the experiments, there's some, um, well, this is not at zero temperature. So how does that actually affect your, how would that affect your simulations if you would do them at finite temperature? Is this something you tried or, or no. is the temperature really low? What, I, I have no idea actually what the temperature is of these experiments. But... No, we haven't tried it. Um, for us, it was more like, you know, fundamental problem to solve. Um, the point is this asymmetry should be there and even at some temperature, right? It's uh, it's really extreme fine tuning to get rid of such a symmetry. And as soon as there is an asymmetry, there has to be a chiral transition. Yeah, but that's exactly my, I, what I, I don't know enough the physics about this, but what happens if you add a finite temperature, probably there's no transitions anymore. No, it's, it's all. Oh, oh, but, um, 
Well, this I don't know, but the fact that they observe lobes means that there is a transition. Right, so let me... Yeah, but I'll put it in one dimension, there's not really... It's for a temperature, you cannot have phase transitions, no? So, here we go. So, in experiments, you really observe from a period for phase, for instance, here, and they observe a transition out of it. So at least they have low enough temperature to, to detect the transition. Yeah. I may ask a question. Mm -hmm. I of course. think I related to what Luca was asking. Had you compute the entanglement entropy here? I mean, for the block, half block, or things like that? Uh, I'm sorry? The entanglement entropy, did you compute, because this is a way to compute the central charge and then to compute, yes. the, you did, right? Yeah, we ex yeah we extracted from Schmidt values from DMRG ah, okay. um, as a function of uh, sub-block size, so along. along the chain. <clears throat> so did you find oscillations as you go through the chain? I mean, up and down, kind of oscillations around the I mean, valley? You share that? We remove Friedel oscillations. Um, yeah, we okay. follow the, yeah. Okay, because this is a way uh, when you got a kind of, at least for Latin year liquid, you can extract a, 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 the radius of compatibility from there. So, are you trying that in this case too? Uh, no, no, we only extract it from. Um, okay. Um, but I, I, if I may say something, I mean, at the Ashkin Teller, you did, you calculated the central charge, it's written here. The other points are non-conformal, so there is no central charge. It's not a conformal okay. theory. I think it's you know it has a dynamical exponent, so probably it would be nice to see how the entanglement entropy diverges if it diverges. But there is no central charge. It's not no, but Frederick, we actually extracted central charge away from it, and we show that it decays. Yeah, but it's not so, defined. I mean, we we don't expect yeah. the central charge because there is no such thing as a central charge in the exactly. So we can your... look at the entanglement entropy. It rather says that conformal symmetries. So, yeah, at the conformal point, you get the logarithmic dependence. Outside from that, you get what? Um, I really cannot hear. Herman was uh, asking uh, whether. Uh, yeah. At the conformal point, it's logarithmic, and this is how you extract. You can extract yes, it. precisely. So, away from it, he was asking how is it varying? That's yeah. also what Luca was asking whether it diverges, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, that would be nice to see, actually, you're right, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Natalia. Yeah. Okay, so I, uh, I think everybody's very happy with this beautiful talk. So uh, let's uh, maybe stop here and thank Natalia again. And uh, 